Thanks for tuning in. Today I'm going to talk about repairing vintage audio equipment for those of you who don't have the expertise to read a schematic well. There's some techniques and tips I'll show you that you can use that may help you uh, when you're repairing a piece of uh, vintage audio gear and you don't have that expertise to, to understand how every circuit works. So I hope you like it and here we go. If you enjoy vintage audio equipment, you've come to the right spot. Please subscribe and hit that notification bell, as well as giving me a big thumbs up if you like this video and share it with others. There is a risk of serious injury or death from electrical shock working on this equipment. If you're not comfortable with working on the equipment, please do not take the cover off and consult a professional. The first thing that you should do is to go to hifienginecom and download the service manual for your particular piece of equipment. Hi-Fi Engine is a great resource and it has 99% of all the audio equipment that was built in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. So do that first. Second of all, you need some sort of a cleaning um, spray. You know, I use Deoxit. I use Deoxit D5. I use Deoxit 100. I use Fader F5. I use the gold spray. Um, and I even have uh, several others. But um, D5 and F5, um, I've, I've used them both for uh, uh, a long, long time on hundreds of different units. And uh, some people have a preference to one over the other. I've never had an issue with either one. Experience is the number one thing that you'll find that you need to work on vintage audio equipment. I don't recommend working on your precious receiver that you went to college with or uh, 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 your dad's receiver that was handed down to you that you want to get going. You don't want to work on that first if you've never worked on this stuff. You want to go get a piece of junk, whether it's at your flea market, a yard sale, Craigslist. Just go get anything and get used to being able to open it up and disassemble it. Uh, you know, that's part of the trick too, is being able to look at these things and how does this come apart. Now, if you downloaded the service manual, usually they'll have some mechanical layouts and even sometimes give you instructions on how to disassemble. But experience, experience, experience. So if you've never attempted this, don't do it with your with your precious equipment. Go get a piece of junk and let it be the guinea pig. And once you get a little bit more comfortable, maybe you can work up, work up to working on your piece of equipment. One thing that you can do is just take a look at your piece of equipment. I had a Sony and still do have the same Sony, a TAF6B. They are known, uh, they're a great little amplifier, first of all, but they are known to have a lot of power supply problems and if you take a look um, they're in a sealed unit I mean imagine how hot that gets it's under a lot of stress anyway and um, you first take a look this unit would not power up it would click a little bit you know you'd hear a little click 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 you know it would just keep clicking and uh, so I did a little research found out as I just said there's a lot of power supply issues well I didn't need really anything I didn't need a meter, I didn't need a scope, I didn't need any piece of equipment other than my eyes. And um, what had happened is one of those electrolytic capacitors that I harp on and harp on and harp on did blow up, uh, blew off a piece of artwork, um, took out a transistor with it, and I can't remember what else, but um, had to repair the uh, artwork with a wire, had to replace the transistor, repair, repaired the 40-year-old capacitor that should have been gone 20 years ago, and guess what? It powered up. So here, that's just an example of how you could repair something with no test equipment. Here's another example, my Pioneer A27 integrated amplifier. Uh, take a look at this filter capacitor. You don't need any equipment to tell you something's wrong there. Um, you know, who knows how many years that had been going on. It probably didn't just happen. You know, it had been going on for uh, 
we'll never know, years probably, and it had started dripping its, its toxic mess down into the chassis all over everything. Now you didn't need any equipment. I didn't need a meter, I didn't need a scope, I didn't need anything. I just needed to take the bottom cover off and take a look. But this again is another reason why I harp on those electrolytic capacitors. They do go bad and the manufacturer of these filter capacitors say you got 15 to 20 years. They were in their 40. You're lucky something worse didn't happen as far as I'm concerned. So again, this is another way you can just take a look to uh, find a problem. You can use a digital multimeter to test the DC offset at the speaker outputs. Uh, you don't even have to remove the cover of a receiver or amplifier, and it just kind of gives you a general health. It's certainly not the end all, but it gives you something. It's simple, it's easy, and it's something that uh, you should do. So um, you're looking for close to zero DC volts at the speaker outputs as you can as you can get and, and normally you're going to have something under 50 millivolts some people say that's too much some people say that's not too bad but but you know closer to zero the better you get up in the 100 millivolt range that's something you're probably going to start to hear possibly uh, at least in the base region so um, you know just gives you a quick little test if you've got you know four or five hundred millivolts out there um, you know it's it's something to maybe be concerned with it doesn't mean it's a, a terrible issue but um, it's just a real quick and easy test that you can do in five minutes so that's something you can do uh, with a multimeter that's fairly easy to do. Now I'll talk about how you can use an oscilloscope and a signal generator to help you troubleshoot a problem with your vintage audio equipment, even if you cannot read a schematic well. Uh, the great thing about stereo equipment is what you've got two channels, so isn't that nice? And if you've got trouble with one channel and the other channel works, well, you've got a helper right there with you, and that's the other channel. Even though the schematics, if you and hopefully you've downloaded the schematic for your piece of equipment, um, most of the time they do a pretty good job about giving you voltages at certain spots, signals at certain pictures of signals at certain spots. So you, it helps you troubleshoot it. But really, when you're inexperienced, your best helper is that other channel. So if you've got 24 volts, let's say at this pin, and you're not sure if that's right or not, if you go over to the other channel and it's 24 volts, then you feel pretty good that's not the problem and you keep moving on. But really for this, you do need an oscilloscope and you do need a signal generator because if you just got music going and uh, you're not going to be able to tell what's going on. You need a, a signal generator that can produce one frequency consistently so you can watch it go through. Um, as I said, you know, the great thing is with two channels, so let's say you've got a receiver. I, I spoke of a preamplifier and amplifier, but let's say you've got a receiver. First of all, and, and you think you've, you've lost one channel, so let's say your left channel is bad. Um, first of all, you've got to figure out, is it all the inputs? So, you know, you hit FM, yeah, my left channel's still out. I hit phono, still my left channel's out. Aux, still my left channel's out. Well, then you can be pretty sure it's not the FM section, it's not the, um, or the phono, you know, because your your, cha your channel's out in, in all of them. So it's probably, it's either in your amplifier section or preamp. When you're actually inside the unit and troubleshooting an issue, you've got to be very careful of not shorting leads together. You also got to be careful for your own safety, as I mentioned before. Um, if you're new at this, you're going to make mistakes. Even if you're not new at it, you're going to make mistakes. And so this is why I said at the beginning, if you are new, get that piece of vintage equipment that you don't care about. Maybe you've got something in your closet. As I said before, purchase one for a few bucks and play with that one. Because inevitably, you're going to make mistakes. We all do. So once again, um, you know, just be very careful in there. Uh, you don't hurt yourself or you don't damage the equipment. So now you can take those two leads from the scope. We know we've got a problem on one channel and you can get one probe 
on one channel, the other probe on the other channel, and compare them. It's great. You've got the best helper ever because, um, you know, there's nobody who knows this stuff better than the other channel, right? So you can compare signals. And if you see a difference, even if you don't understand what you're seeing, you know it's different. And then you can work your way back to where they're the same. And um, you'll be able to narrow down a problem instead of when you first open this, these pieces of equipment up, if you haven't before, it's gonna be daunting. You're just gonna look at it and go, you know, where do I even start? But just take it a block at a time and narrow it down and you'll find that with experience, as I mentioned before, um, it gets easier and easier, and that's the whole key. I think most people that work on this stuff, you know, they'll tell you that you'll have certain certain projects that are very, very difficult, um, but over time, you gain more experience, and it gets easier. Just like anything, I'm sure you guys out there, you all do something very well, and you might be able to even teach somebody like me what you do. I wouldn't be as good as you at first, but I'd have to keep practicing, and that's what you got to do with this. You know, as I said before, you just got to be, you know, aware of the electrical shock potential here uh, for both you and the equipment. So um, I hope you've enjoyed this video. I've tried to give you a little bit of um, information about how, even if you're not an expert, that you can kind of get in there and gain a little bit of experience and maybe down the road you will be an expert. So I th hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, I'd appreciate a, a big thumbs up down below if you uh, like this video. And also, if you're not a subscriber and you think I'm worthy of it, I'd appreciate a subscription. So y'all have a great day.